There I am, finally live, everybody. You're back at Plan Tribe. Welcome, welcome to Sunday. Well, you know, it's Sunday, but uh, our podcast will run on the Tuesday. And I'm so, so thrilled to be with you guys on the weekend this week. Um, welcome to your backup plan um, to our podcast and our YouTube channel this week. If you guys are new here, welcome to our channel. My name is Tina Ginn. I am an emergency preparedness coach, a best selling author, a financial expert, and an app developer of your backup plan app. We post step by step tutorials, uh, sometimes current events in the news. Uh, tips and tricks from our interviews and our, our whatever else I feel like posting that week. I interview real life people each and every week with their real life story. And they are amazing, inspirational and motivational stories all in one. Be sure to hit the red subscribe button down here in the corner and tap on that bell so you get notified when things get uploaded. Give this a thumbs up. I would love to hear from you in our comments as well. Thank you again for coming out. Your backup plan app puts your life in one in preparation of any unpredictable circumstance uh, for any unforeseen, unexpected event while taking the painful aftermath out of that tragedy. And my special guest this week is with Tony Lynch, and I'm just going to welcome him on. Hi, Tina. Welcome, welcome, Tony. How you doing, Tina? I'm good. I'm good today. Um, Tony Lynch is coming to us from Colorado this week. He's uh, got a nonprofit called Memories of Us. He is a podcaster. Uh, he has a YouTube channel and a website, um, and I'll let him go through all that, and I'll put the description of everything down below. And we are going to talk about a topic which is so dear to Tony's heart about grief. And perhaps you can let us in on your little journey that you've been through. And I love everything that you are doing to help people, Tony. It's absolutely beautiful. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I guess my journey to starting Memories of Us um, started started after I lost my son. And um, you know, as a as a parent, uh, this is the worst thing that you ever ever can imagine, right? You know, or um, you know, we we don't often think about these things. We think that you know these things don't happen. Um, but they, but they actually do, you know, um, just a, just a little bit of, about that journey where it actually started. Cause it started way before he passed away. It started, um, October 31st, Halloween, the year prior, 2015, um, that day I was, it was he and I, I was taking him to see a buddy of his, you know, a little friend, little play date, you know, and, um, he was on clonidine, a medication used for um, to kind of slow the heart down a little bit for people who are hypotensive and, you know, it helps them slow down to think. And so he was on that for around two years prior to, to the incident. Well, that day, um, early that day, we went over and met up with his friends and everything, and they were going to, to a football game. And so we was gonna meet up with them later on. And so we left, we go home. He reminded me to give him his medication. And 45 minutes later, um, he collapsed. And I had no idea, you know? So I picked him up, we were actually outside. I picked him up, carried him in the house, and he was kind of in and out for a little bit. Then he finally just went to sleep. So. I remember making a phone call to his mother, telling her what was going on. Um, and immediately after that, I grabbed him and took him to the pharmacist. And I told him, I said, there's something wrong with this. You know, there's there's something wrong. I just gave it to him and he collapsed. And he said, well, just take him home, let him sleep. You know, he's probably tired, you know. And, but it was so much wor more worse than that. You know, his mother finally, uh, finally got to my home 
we realized that we needed to take him to the hospital. We get him down there, come to find out. It was it was a massive overdose. Um, oh. So it was three days in the hospital of him going through seizures and, and things like that. And um, eventually on the third day, he woke up. This this happened over the weekend, so we couldn't get anyone in to test the uh, test what was in a bottle. But the doctors um, used everything except for what they were supposed to. So and they kept trying to figure out why, why, why. Uh, and that Sunday night, they finally came to us, and their words were, he, "We think he has a rare blood. I mean, a rare brain disorder where the nerves are being stripped away from um, the sheeting is being stripped away from his brain." So it was that bad. Well, then come the next following morning, he woke up. They finally tested it. And so on his bottle, it, he was supposed to have received 0.01 milligrams of the content in per per ml, per milliliter. Right. Well, when they tested it, it was 1,000 milligrams per ml. So it was it was it was a horrible thing to see, you know. Um and it was yeah, like too much at once then. Yeah, yeah, it was it was a mad like they they their words to us were they were surprised that he actually made it. And uh if you don't know anything about clonidine, clonidine is a heart medication. And um, you know, I'm still trying to figure out why why my child was on it, but um I had no say so in it. CPS at the time, you know, we were fighting with yeah. well, going through the courts with them. So we struggled. I struggled getting my getting my son, only to have him do that. And then the overdose happens. Um that was October going into November. He was fine um for like the next nine months, you know, typical kid. We didn't put him back on the medication and life seemed pretty normal. It, it okay. really made it seem pretty normal for a while. You know, he was out playing. We was going going swimming and things like that. You know, he was my he was my buddy. He was my road buddy, man. You know, it was just always he and I. Even though his mm -hmm. mom was in the picture, she worked three jobs. And so I pretty much was a single parent. I loved every minute of it. I, I went and traded for the world, you know. Um, and I remember in June... Um, Things changed. Things changed dramatically. Uh, he got sick on a sat well on a Sunday. Usually Sundays were our days to go to church, um, but and he just didn't have any energy. He was vomiting. You know, he wasn't feeling good. He was cramping up, and and everything. And I thought maybe he just had a stomach virus because the day before he was just over at his friend's house, uh, playing with her, and it was her birthday. You know, and. Um, they were playing, they were out skateboarding and all of these things. And uh, it was just a just a good time. You know, when the time came, he'd come home, I cook his dinner. We get ready to watch our nightly movie uh, and just spend daddy son time together. You know, that was our time to sit down and relax and, you know, just enjoy each other. And um, he seemed pretty fine. The next day he got up, he was sick. So I started messing with him because our big thing was, like I said before, was going to church. and. There was times I used to try to skip out. So, it, 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 <laughs> nope, um, this Sunday, Daddy, we got to get up. We got to get breakfast. We got to get the showers going, you know, and we got to get out the door because he loved being around the kids there. He loved the environment yeah, and he loved learning. And um, so that was our thing. And uh, when he didn't want to go, I knew something was wrong. I just didn't know that it was leading up to him eventually passing. So for three days, you know, um, his mom and I worked around the clock trying to, you know, making sure his fever was taken care of, making sure that he was getting the proper amount of fluids. And then one day he just got up and he was running around. And um, so his mother, the day after that, which was on a Monday, um, she took him to see his family, see his family doctor. And um, he, I got a phone call saying that we needed to go to the emergency room. So I was at work at the time. I was driving trash truck. So I immediately called my office, tell them, hey, I'm coming in. I have to go to the emergency room. My son is in there. Then I get there just to find out that um, he was, he started urinating blood. 
And so I mean, we was going, okay, something's not right here. But we're around mm -hmm. doctors, right? So we go to the emergency room. We're thinking, you know, we're we're going to figure this out. It's going to be okay, you know. Um, and that's what I could, just kept telling myself. And um, well, you would so think so. You're in the right place, right? Right, you know. But unfortunately, um, it was not like that. Um, it was a bad. So we go from one hospital with a bad experience get go to another hospital now we start to have another bad experience because oh, no. they they kept trying to draw blood and my question to them was after i seen what was going on um his blood was clotting so automatically i'm thinking you know he's a kid your body should you you should not be yeah. your blood should not be clotting like there should be a nice little flow but instead it was squirting out like and um so they were going, he was dehydrated. So they got him, you know, they can't find his nerves now. And so it's just a sequence of events leading up to the initial um, passing. Um, so going back a little bit, we, we sat in the hospital for nine hours, nine hours. They can't figure out what's going on. Um, and so they eventually came and said, this is beyond our expertise. So nine hours of sitting there, I'm watching my son slowly decline, you know? So I'm laying in bed with him, um, trying to comfort him. We're watching cartoons on my phone and everything. And he's, he's not doing well. And, and how remember, old is he, Tony? He was eight. Okay. And uh, I remember his words to me when I asked him if he was okay. He goes, no, I feel like I'm fading away. I go, no, you're not fading away. You're okay, you know? So eventually the, the, the nurses came in and they said that we were going to have to get airlifted down to another another children's hospital down in Denver. And uh, so they gave him some morphine. They asked him where he was hurting. He had been in pain for quite some time, which he kept trying to tell them. And they just totally ignored us. So they eventually gave him morphine. The uh, helicopter palace come, and uh, it was it was like deja vu because they were the first ones who took us, who airlifted us down to Children's Hospital the first time. So needless to say, now they are a palace again. So I'm going, hey, you know. So we're conversating, and same thing, you know, same yeah. scenario. We're in the helicopter. Now we're going down to the hospital, and we get there. The doctors are great. They get down there, and uh, they immediately started running tests. Um. So I remember the doctor comes to us. He goes, I don't know. I don't know what's in his blood. We can't get enough for a sample. So what we're going to do, um, his words to us were, um, I've had this happen before and I lost a little girl. So he tells us, we don't, I don't want that to happen again. So what we're going to do is that we're going to give him a super antibiotic, which is going to kill everything in his blood. We're going to do a transfusion. Sounds very simple right? Yeah. So sounds promising. It sounds very promising because, um, you know, it gives us hope, you know, that we, we're going to get through this. Mm. And um, so his mom and I step out, the doctors go in to give him the antibiotic. He's doing, he's doing fine, you know? And uh, so they start the transfusion. Now this is where all hell breaks loose. Oh dear. Because two minutes into the infusion, the, the there was a cold blue. His mom is his mom and I are standing outside the door talking about you know we're we're going to leave this we're going to leave Colorado and just start somewhere else. You know we wasn't together, but we was going to do that for our son. You know we wanted to make sure that we were going to be good parents. It unfortunately it didn't happen that way. But you so, wanted to make it right. Is yeah, what... we wanted to make it right. We yeah. wanted to go to a different place to where um, we can give them better opportunities and just give them a good life. Right. And um, so um, the cold blue is now going. And so the doctor is going across or the nurses are yelling out and people from all around the hospital are now starting to pile into this room. We're looking over and the scene was out of something that you would see out of a movie. People are handing back bags. You know, there's there's people over there trying to put ice packs on them and all sorts of things, right? Um, and then 
you hear those words. <clears throat> Go get the parents. Um, we're losing them. So <clears throat> they clear out as we're walking in and I see my son take his last breath, you know, the one doctor's on the side of him doing chest compressions and this, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, that was the last time, you know. Um, That's crazy. It is um, because it was so unexpected. So what do you think went wrong with the blood transfusion then? What, what's the understanding? Um, no one knows. His, oh. um, his death was ruled unknown causes. And so I, I live with that, you know, um, I live with the images. Um, I, I won't really get into that, but I would tell you. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, it's, I live with that every day for like the last five years, almost five years now. Um, so after that, um, still trying to find answers. We can't point the finger at anyone. Uh, but that was um, just the start of the what was going on. His mother, um, which I thought we was going to work together, you know, we had some a few lawsuits that were that were in the works, we was supposed to work together to get through this, you know, try to right. figure out some answers. In turn, the one person that I thought that um, would be in my corner, turn out to be the one that when she seen how much we were supposed to get as far as the settlement, she turned her back on me. And um, then it became a personal battle between she and I. Right. I eventually just gave up. I told her, I said, you know, if you want the money, you take it. It does, it does mean nothing. So years went on with that. And um, so she, she did what she did. And uh, I look at that and I just go, you know, okay. I haven't talked to her in a very long time. That's fine. So it just made the journey that much more interesting from, for me, you know, after being bashed by her and, and everything right. else, um, you know, then I'm dealing with the loss of my son. Yeah. The um, emotions. They are all the emotions. Right. And as we know, they, we have a huge problem in society. Society tells us, tells men, you know, it's not manly to have these emotions. You got to suck it up. You got to put your head up and keep pressing forward. Take a deep breath and keep pressing forward. Well, I did that, you know, for for a while. Um, and I figured I would try to get back into a routine. So I started going back to church, but then I realized um, it wasn't the same. No. You know, people, people looked at me differently. Um, at least in my own mind, you know, when you're going through something like that, you always think people are looking at you. You always think that people have these negative thoughts about you. Um, and it wasn't like that. What I found out later was that no one knew how to approach me. So what I did, I started staying away from the crowd. I would come in after everybody would go into the big room. I would stand right. outside and watch the yeah. sermon on TV and I would leave before everybody got there just to just to keep it down and, and then i realized it was i was isolating you know because i would go home and i wouldn't come out the house right and i did that for two years I, I did that for two years and you know when we talk about the stages of grief and things like that i had two things working for me which i thought was working for me in my favor one i didn't have to come out my house and unless i want unless i needed to go to work and uh you know and get food but i had my weights there now, two is your addiction. Now, I didn't drink, you know, I don't drink or anything like that, but my addiction was working out. But then it became more of a challenge after that because now, you know, here I am, I go home every day to an empty house. And I'm constantly waiting for someone to tell me that this is a joke, you know? Yeah. So now the stage of denial, right? I don't want to believe this. No, you know? Who, who does this? Who, who goes yeah. to this, right? What happened? <laughs> yeah, what happened? But now the crazy part about it is, is that where I lived at, my neighbor, when I first moved in there, had lost her, their oldest son. When I lost my son, shortly after that, during my isolation, you know, there was a few people that I can relate to, and they were one of them, my next door neighbors. Well, they end up losing their second son. And I'm going, 
Holy cow. Yeah, so you start, you start to look at this and you go, if I told anybody that I live next door, like me and my next door neighbor, we now have something in common, but they now just lost their second son and no one can tell them why, you know? So mind blown, right? <laughs> and I was going, wow. But, it, you know, hurt people attract hurt people. Sometimes I pass just in a lock with one another. So I'm watching them go through their grieving process as I'm going through through mine. And we're supporting one another without actually supporting one another, you know? That's, like, that's awesome. where I went to, you know? And it, it was pretty cool. Um, and then the journey goes on, right? It gets worse. That's that's what what I wanted want to really put out there. It does get worse. It got a lot worse. Um, because during that isolation, I started looking at my personal training or my fitness. I started challenging myself. You know, I'm already in this much pain. How can I hurt myself more? Mm -hmm. And I did, you know, it, it was impossible, you know, because I realized that there's different types of pain, right? And the grieving process, according to, according to a society, you know, um, supposed to um, be not so bad for a man. Um, that's a complete lie. <laughs> it's a, true, it's though, a complete isn't it? lie. Yeah, it's a, it's a complete lie. And um, I think it's because they don't talk about it. Yeah, we don't. Uh, yeah, and you're absolutely right. We don't talk about it, you know, because, you know, our, the people, our friends mean well when we go through that. Our family mean well. But eventually they do have to go back to their life, right? You know, it's not like that they forget you. Um, sometimes it becomes too much. Yeah. Whereas deep down inside, the person that's going through it, you want to talk about it. You want to you want to know that you're not by yourself in this journey. I know I did. I wanted to know that I wasn't by myself, and I wasn't. You know, but it was the it, it was the little bits and pieces that came around. You know, I had friends of mine that um, had experienced such things that had came out the woodworks, and I hadn't even known. You know, because in society we look like they look very normal right living normal lives but deep down inside they were hurting and those were the guys that were coming to me and saying hey we need to talk and i would look, i would get on the defensive about, about what well you know i need to tell you something hold on before you try to counsel me i don't want it as a matter of fact just leave me alone they go no i want to tell you that um i've gone through this and so it started i started loosening up a little bit you started opening up. Yeah, I started opening up because we had that similarity. You know, my first friend that came to me uh, is that, as a matter of fact, that morning, uh, my real my real good friend Jason. Um, I saw him. He he was so used to seeing me and my son together. My son had just passed away four hours prior, and uh, I remember I, I went home. I couldn't be there. I left. I go down to the store. He immediately notices that my son is not with me. He asks, I tells him. He goes outside. He tells me, I got to talk to you. So he, he's the first one to reveal that he had had a similar experience. He had lost his son as well. And so then a couple of weeks after that, another good friend of mine, Joseph, comes to me. He was like, hey, you know, I want to bring you over for a barbecue, not knowing that our conversation was going to be along the lines of him losing his son too, right? So now, you know, even though it wasn't in a big group setting, these individuals started popping up. And then next thing you know, there's like five guys that I know. And so oh, now wow. we have this little camaraderie. They, they were there throughout. Um, now, throughout this time, I had my mother, you know, and my sister. And uh, so I used to always call my mother up. And... Uh, my mother, <laughs> believe it or not, she used to always tell me because I used to break down and start crying. She goes, baby boy, don't cry. D don't cry, you know? So again, society tells us, don't cry. Don't. Now here it is, the mother, the, the person that I look up to is the ones telling me not to cry. So I'm, I have to be strong. She goes, you have, to, you, have to, you have to be a man now. You're gonna have to suck it up, son, you know? Um, oh, don't what cry. What does that look like? <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, right? You know, and I'm thinking to myself like, you know, um, okay. But then I realized that she had never experienced losing a child before. Because, or anything? Has she oh, lost anything? Um, at that moment, she had lost uh, uh, my mother, uh, her mother, which is my grandmother. Um, she had lost her father. She had lost 
her mother's mother. So we went backwards in time. We lost her mother all the way down to my great grandmother. So my mother had the chance to experience that. Even though I was around, what I saw in front of me was this strong, this strong, beautiful woman, you know, still trying to raise, still raising, not even trying. She was raising two kids, you know, on her own. Now, when I say on her own, my father was around, you know, he was, he was around. Was he the best role model? No, um, but he was a good man. And what I mean by that, you know, the things that he taught me, um, I got my passion for fishing from him. You know, um, I got my drive, my resilience in life from him, but also get it from my mother too, because I watched them in different aspects go through life um, and, and hit challenges and keep pressing forward and keep pressing. So that was already instilled to me. Right. Now, my mother did experience these things. Um, when my father passed away, that was the first time that I saw my mother cry. My father passed away maybe, he's been gone now nine years, almost 10 years. My little brother passed away three months after that. And then my father's brother passed away two months after that. So the family got hit again. I watched my mother shed a tear, but I also watched her drown her emotions in alcohol. Oh. You know, um, I watched her go through the coping mechanism. You know, back then crack was a huge thing, right? My mother started experimenting with it, but then she quickly realized that, no, I'm not going to do this. So as fast as I watched her experimenting with it, um, she jumped out just as quick and went, no. So she dove deeper into alcoholism. So I didn't understand at that time. It was a curious thing to me to watch my mother go through this. She's mm -hmm. strong. You know, the, she's the woman who raised me. Now, fast forward to her telling me to suck it up and be a man. Um, yeah. She was my example. Right. She was my example. So I did. I, I, I sucked it up. Then I realized when she passed away, I was there. She had passed away from a stroke two years after my son. Now, my son passed away seven days before Father's Day. Well, he was born seven days before Christmas. So he was my Christmas baby, December 18th. He passed away um, June 8th, um, which is seven days before Father's Day, which happens to be my mother's birthday. My mother passed away two years after that, mm -hmm. on my grandmother's birthday, which is July 25th. So if you think if the universe doesn't have all of this all figured out already? Uh, you know, um, <laughs> I, I think the universe was was playing, was messing with me for a while. <laughs> for 10 That's years. What it felt like I went, you know, how is this possible? <laughs> if I break this down, I went, oh my God, this, how yeah. does this work? You know, because, you know, I look at my holidays different now. Like I stopped celebrating holidays. You know, Christmas is not the same for me. New Year's, Valentine's no. Day, it was always me and my son. We always found ourselves at a at a restaurant and everything. You know, Father Father Sunday. I didn't, I wasn't with anyone at the time. And um, my son, he was, he was, he was the love of my life. You know, I have two girls and they are the love of my life. But my son, I had a special bond with them, with, right. with him. You know, and um, so that was our thing. So Valentine's Day, all of these different holidays. Now going going forward, when my mother passes away, it wasn't shortly after that to where my journey took a downhill, downhill turn. Um, and the path that I was on became so blurred. I didn't know what I was going to do anymore. You know, so my mother passes away. And so I was that, down really, there. that really hit you. Yeah. To, at that stage that you were at the two year mark. Yeah. To... And, and it was, I, I was still grieving the loss of my son, you know, yeah. and had not allowed myself to take that journey. When my mother passed away, it's like the, the seed opened up and I was given no choice, you know, um, cause now I watched my, the woman who raised me, my best friend, um, she's gone. I watched her pass away. Right. And now, you know, as they say, the women are the glue to your family. It's, it's absolutely right. Because now my mother was the oldest out of all her siblings. And now her siblings are falling apart. Now her kids are falling apart. I go, I come back 
to Colorado. Um, and that's where, that's where everything just, you know, I really started to get a good understanding of the stages of grief, you know? So I end up, I end up telling myself, I don't, I'm, I'm done being alone. You know, I'm, I'm tired of being alone. I was trying to mask what I was going through. I, I wanted somebody to be there for me. So I started online dating. I met, I met a, met a woman, um, and we started doing a long distance relationship. Feelings started going about. Eventually I made a decision because the, where I was living at, um, those memories of my son are still there. I'm still getting right. up in the middle of the night. See, I guess I was wearing two faces at the time. So what you saw in society, you know, was, was this man proud, you know, you saw always saw me cracking jokes, um, and helping others get through their hard times. What people didn't see is that at night, I, I spent a lot of times curled up on the floor, you know, crying, hurting, asking, you know, for, uh, some sort of relief. Right. And, um, one thing was certain was for certain, I wasn't going to start drinking. That's always been my downfall. I wasn't going to do that. So now I'm forced, you know, um, to, in life to find, to find yeah. something, to find yeah. something that will give you that strength. To yeah, I was, I was, I was looking for, I was looking for a hold, you know, uh, and I couldn't find one. And then, you know, with the young lady that I was dating at the time, she lived in South Dakota. I lived here. And so I made the decision to move out there only to be moving back to Colorado three months later, oh, shortly after, shortly after uh, February, you know, shortly after Valentine's Day. So now the Valentine's Day is all screwed up, right? I had lost everything. I, I, I had lost everything. I had given up everything when I was here, only took the bare minimum. You know, I took my weights with me because that was part of who I was. At the time I was building a personal training company. And uh, so I, didn't like going to gym. So I built my own gym, you know, by turning my garage into my playground. Right. And uh, so I stayed focused on that. I moved out there, um, moved back just with what I could put in my vehicle. So, you know, now, now life is personal, right? And I'm telling the universe, why are you doing this to me? I didn't do anything to you, you know? So my faith at that time was wrecked. You know, my relationship with God was pretty much non-existent. You know, I used to have a really good relationship with him. Um, that's how I became the man I was becoming. I, I didn't have a role model to show me how to be a man. So I went, who's the best man I know? God, right? Mm -hmm. So I started, started wanting, pursuing that relationship with him. I wanted to understand more of what he wanted from me. How can I become a better man? How, and how do I become a better version of myself? <laughs> Mm -hmm. you know, to, for, for not just me, because I realized that it was bigger than me at that time. I just didn't know how. And so I began that journey. When I had looked back on all the losses, I tell everybody, I grieved for 30 years and didn't even know it, you know, until this moment, now the light's starting to go off. I've lost everything. I hit my version of rock bottom. I don't and know why that, we have to do that though. You, you know? know, because it's a good starting point. When you look well, back I on guess, it, but it's not fair. <laughs> it's it's not fair, but when you when you think about it, think about the lessons that rock bottom teaches you that you know what I'm saying, um, that you can't learn anywhere else. That's the beautiful part about it. And I started realizing that once I started connecting the dots. I hit rock bottom so many times throughout my life and just never realized. But there was something inside of me that said, This is I'm not gonna let this beat me. So learning that and having that inside of me going through what I was going through and being at the moment that I was at that, uh, at, at that point in my life, you know, I had lost everything. Um, I had, you know, you felt like you lost yourself. Yeah. I had, oh, that's, that was the main part. I had lost myself because the person I thought that I was going to spend the rest of my life with now I'm in a situation to where I moved in with her. And um, so she taught me a lesson, you know, when you give up that power, regardless of what happens, if a person tells you, you know, um, it's over, you eventually have to make a choice. 
Yeah. You know, so I, I chose, I wasn't, I, I'm not the fighting type. I'm not going to argue, you know, you, I feel that if, in, if you're in a situation like that, someone says something to you, you have to respect that. Yeah. Because even though that we're together, I always keep in my mind, this is not my place. There's nothing on the paperwork that says that is mine or that I'm even a part of this. We just have a verbal agreement. Right. That, you know, that you can back out at any moment. And so when that happened, um, I left. I, I reality had turned around on me, and what followed after that, you know, I stayed with friends for a while, still dealing with the nightmares of my son, my mother, um, with the thoughts of my father, father, everyone else that I've known, you know, friends that I've known um, that have passed away, and just all of these different things. So here I am you know, scrounging around, couch hopping from this place to that place, you know, sleeping in my car most nights. Um, um, once in a while, to, I get a motel room, you know, trying to, sleep to find in there. Yourself. trying to find myself. I, I, I was wondering, but this time it was like, I was just going around in that, in that spiral. And I didn't realize that, you know, in that place where I was at, I called my, my dark place, you know, and it was, it had consumed me to a point to where I didn't trust anyone. Um, I didn't want anyone around me. If I had to do this, you know, I didn't, I didn't want anybody's help. I, I wasn't going to be dependent on anyone. Sad part about it is it's that I had a girlfriend at the time that didn't know I was, I was going through this. And I went, maybe I'm in the wrong relationship. Yeah. Because you know, if you don't notice what I'm going through, then Wow. Why, why are we together? This is, this is crazy, right? Is she in a different world or something? I like to think so. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, it, but it is the way, you know, I, I've always, I tell people my chooser, my chooser has been broken for quite some time. So when it came to choosing women, I was an expert at it. <laughs> I've always chose the wrong ones, you know, and I've gotten better over time, <laughs> but, but I had to go, okay, so this is not working. <laughs> but what it was is that I had been on and off with the, with the girl that I was, had jumped back into a relationship with after I just got back to Colorado. I, we, she and I had been on and off for six years. And uh, so now we're back together again, right? Things have changed dramatically. I'm not the same person um, that she remembers. She's not the same person that I remember. We've now have our own set of traumas that we're dealing with. And um, we didn't ha know how to come together. So we had both embarked on our own individual journeys to where she had became self-sufficient and couldn't depend on anyone. And I had done the same thing on each end. So when it came down to it, you know, I'm not dependent on you for anything. So we're already separated at there. So we, it was, it was, it was a, yeah. it was a battle that neither one of us was going to win. And it took me realizing that, you know, I don't want to waste any more of her time. And I don't want her wasting any more of my, I mean, we spend so much time apart. We might as well not embark on this. So eventually um, we broke it off and I'm still going through all of these things. You know, eventually I had gotten to, you know, like I said, that my version of rock bottom, I had given up. Um, the personal training company that I started, I stopped pursuing it and everything. And that was a strong passion of mine, helping people get healthy, yeah. um, finding, finding their true selves within their, within themselves, you know, becoming strong mentally and physically. And I was really good at it. So 18 years of that. And I'm just going, I don't want to do it anymore. I, I just don't. So I let my company go to the wayside. And uh, I actually, actually let myself go too. You know, I, I stopped doing those things um, I stopped pursuing um, a place anymore. All the things you loved. All, everything that I've loved. I realized it wasn't here anymore. What I didn't see was that on the other side of that, I had friends that loved me. I have a little sister that loved me, even though we never said anything, or maybe I just didn't want to hear it. I had made my mind up. So 
this is this is where it gets interesting. I spent two weeks, over two weeks, planning my suicide. I had gotten to a point to where I went, I don't want to be here anymore. Yeah. I don't. And um, if there's any man listening to this, we we get to that point. This is where this is where that understanding comes from and how I came about building my nonprofit. So I spent two weeks planning. I started watching people's, you know, um, habits. Who calls me when? You know, how long in between do he call me? Oh, so wow. I was, I was, I st- yeah, I started observing things. I started observing the people around me. I started noticing that, you know, the time in between that they used to visit me became further and further. So I went, I'm going to use this to my advantage. And to my friends that are listening to this, um, I apologize, but I did do it. And I know we've said that you've heard the story um, and I've told you um, several times, but it is it is the truth. I planned it out and I used their habits to be able to do it because I needed a section to where I knew no one would bother me. No one, no one would worry about where I was. They got used to me disappearing from time to time, right? So it became habit. They knew if I disappeared, I would show back up. So it was that one moment that they I thought they let their guard down and I took off. And um that, that's really extreme, Tony. It it was. It was very extreme. I mean, I'm dealing with homelessness. I'm dealing with the emotional turmoil of my grief, you know, losing my son. And, you know, I, I felt like an orphan. I felt like, you know, I, I felt like God abandoned me for no reason. You know, and I and I couldn't understand that. I went, how is it that, you know, I had this beautiful relationship with me and the one person that I trusted hurt me to a point to where I, I could not understand why I was obedient in my walk, you know, um, not in the religion aspect, but in my walk with him to pursuing that relationship with him. I wanted to feel his grace on a steady basis. And this is the same person. I felt, I felt betrayed. And it was a, such a familiar feeling because throughout my life, everyone, friends that I knew, um, were the same ones that betrayed me, tried to get me killed. Um, the females that I was with um, were the ones that left me in the times that I needed them the most. I felt betrayed. Now, the one person that I'm opening up to, th- developing this relationship with, with the understanding that you'll never leave me, you you just crushed me, yeah. everything inside of me. So I went, you betrayed me. I don't, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do this anymore with you. You know, you don't want me here. I don't want to be here anymore. So I had no place in this world. So I trekked out um, that Friday afternoon after work, you know, normal week, go to work and everything. But in the back of my mind, I already know I had planned out those steps. I knew um, where I was going to do it. I knew I was going to take the time to do something that I'm very passionate about, which is fishing. And that was something that I shared with my son. Um, and so it was time for me to to reconnect with him and let him know I'll be seeing you soon. You know, like I'm done. I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. So I trekked out to Utah mm. um, that Friday. I, I trekked out there and ended up staying at a motel that night. The next following day, that Saturday, I spent all day fishing the Snake River. And it was it was a blast, you know. I did a whole lot of catch and release and everything. Took a couple of fish with me, uh, and then later on that night, I did, I find myself over in the Moab, and I venture off to the middle of nowhere. There's there's this it's a it's a full moon out, the stars are out, you know. It's just me in the middle of nowhere, and um, I did a little camping, ate the fish and everything, and um, just had a conversation with my son, my mother my father and my grandmothers, people that I cared about that were no longer here. I was telling them, you know, hopefully you you can forgive me, um, but this is, this is what I choose. No one else gets to choose my life for me. So in my mind, I was taking back control. And I remember that moment, I was seconds away for pulling that trigger. And a voice called out, just as 
clear as we talking, like a loud scream. Someone called my name, right? And I thought to myself, where did I slip up at? Who who followed me? You know, yeah. no one knows that I'm here. And so constantly, you know, I, I put the gun down and I peek up from around my car and I'm looking around. There's nobody there. There's absolutely nobody there. Now, this is where my spiritual journey restarts. You know, this is where it picks back up. And I remember, I remember the voice telling me, be careful who talks to you, you know, um, because your enemy still has a voice as sweet as the day that he was born. You got to remember, he was the first angel. Nothing changed. Nothing changed about him. His voice is still sweet. He's, you know, he was the, he was the first. And um, I, I realized that the battle that had been that I had been pursued on to get to that point had been more spiritual that I was not going to win. And at that point, I surrendered. I went. This is bigger than me. Um, I was just going to say that. Yeah, it, it became so much more bigger than me, you know, and that voice has guided me ever since then. So I I leave there, I throw the gun away um, in the middle of the desert, you know, I, I throw it away, <laughs> I jump in the car and I drive back, you know, and maybe someone will need it sometime. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully not. Ho hopefully, you know, hopefully no one gets to that point. But on the way back. I started connecting the dots. You know, here I am driving down this dark road in the middle of the night, heading back towards Colorado. And I started noticing a pattern in my life. And I went, hmm, what is this? You know, what 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 is this? And yeah. so no one ever taught me about mental health issues. I was, I I struggled. I struggled, right? But I knew that was a part of it. I knew that what I was going through. Everything started making sense. Let's just put it that way. Everything started making sense. So I get back to Colorado. And the first thing I'm thinking to myself is that I have to get my shit together. If I do not get my shit together, I am not going to survive this. And someone said something to me um, along the lines of that previous to that. There's grief that can kill you. Right. And as a man, you know, you we don't think of like that, right? We already yeah. get to that point. And usually it's too late. You know, normally people get to the point, boom, it's done. It's over with, right? But it's yeah. the sequence of events leading up to that point. So the sequence of events leading up to the point to me attempting to take my life, very determined about it too, to finding finding a meaning behind it, finding um, my, my curiosity, which led me into, you know, I... I I need to get some help. And that stemmed from the guys who had came through. It just never really dawned on, dawned on me at that moment that we have a problem. So I, I did seek help and I was looking for men's groups, you know, because I, I, I knew that I wasn't going to talk about talk around women. You know, yeah. I needed to get past my own self first before I got to that point. So most of the groups I encountered were co-ed. There or and most women, mostly the women that was there, there was very few men. And I realized inside of these groups, the men weren't talking. Then eventually we began to dissipate, right? So then you find yourself in a group full of women that's supposed to be co-ed, or it was based around children and women. And I'm going, where are the men's groups? Yeah. We have a problem. So you run across these men outside of these groups, nigga. I'm not going back there. I'm not going to talk around these women. So Again, light bulb goes off. I began to ask them, if there was a men's grievance group, would you attend? They were like, oh, yeah. You know, well, that's we, we're looking for that connecting if it was other men, but we're so spread out around each other that when we see each other, we don't even know. Well, I, I, that's where I believe things get kind of simple because I started realizing that hurt people hurt people. It's not that we don't know. We see each other all the time and we attract each other. We just never know why. So I started using that to my advantage. You know, um, when it started happening to me, I started running across men. I've had men talk to me in the middle of stores, right? And I realized the conversations that we was having, we've hugged and cried in the middle of people. And I've had women come up and go, I wish more men would do that. So again, now that doorway is opening up, that voice is telling me, 
pay attention to the path that you're on. And I went, I remember, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, went, I went, okay, you know, um, how am I supposed to do this? And it just kept telling me, pay attention to the path that you're on. Everything will make sense. So I remember just following that voice. And I went, I remember sitting around with a friend of mine one day and I went, I'm going to start a nonprofit. And he looks at me, he goes, a nonprofit? I go, yeah. I just don't know how I'm supposed to do it. But I'm going to start a men's group um, because I think I think it will benefit. And he goes, well, Tony, you know, that's going to be really hard. I said, I know. That's the beautiful part about it is, is that I'm up for the challenge. I do think that this, this could work. So first thing I did is that, you know, now I have this idea. I'm going to start this nonprofit. So gave birth to men like me first, right? Mm -hmm. Then I started doing research and it was already taken. So then I was going, how do I start a nonprofit? I think I need to get a 5113C. So where do I start about that? So I got in contact with a company and said, I'm looking to start a 5113C. Now, this is where this journey gets pretty interesting and in how I birthed, um, how I birthed um, my nonprofit memories of us. So during this process of, of pushing forward, trying to understand, and I'm talking with this guy, and he asked me a few questions. And he goes, hey, have you ever started a nonprofit before? No. Have you ever volunteered for one? No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so all I know is I have this idea, right? I'm like, no, no. So I'm already answering no to these questions. So now I'm being discouraged. Uh, and he goes, well, what does, do you have men to go, Do have you started a support group? No. Do you have a Facebook group? I go, no. <laughs> it goes, well, um, he goes, I love your idea, but I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to have to put in some work. And I go, well, you know, I can start working for grants. And he laughed at me. This guy laughed at me. Right. But it's, it was in a, in a way of young man, um, I'm going to give you a piece of advice and uh, don't take it personal but take it and run with it. He goes, you just answered no to every question that I've asked you. You haven't even started. He goes, my advice to you, start. Start with the idea. So when you talk to me, call me back when, when, you, when you got an idea of what you wanna do because they laid out, laid out this structure for me. He sent me information. He goes, I normally don't do this, but I, I'm, I'm gonna lay out this structure for you. Use it to the best of your ability. So I'm going to think to myself, going, okay, I see this sheet in front of me. I'm going, okay, I have to start somewhere. So for two weeks, I walked around. And I'm going, how do I start a fully functional nonprofit from nothing, right? So go back to the drawing board. Let's figure out a name about this. You know, what is the what what, what are the things that 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 go about this? What are the things that men protect the most? So I thought to myself, memories. What are our memories of? Isn't memories that of funny? Our one? Yeah, right. Yeah, you know, because and I go on. Up. <laughs> yeah, it's it's the memories that we that we hold dear. And when it comes down to a man, right, we protect those. These are little secrets that we don't tell anybody. This is the these are the memories that we can take. And when we're drowning ourselves in our our coping mechanisms, um, whether it be alcohol or drugs, you know, no matter what it is, it's those moments that we're spending there. Yeah, we, we can protect it. We can put it inside of here. We can protect our heart and no one can take those away from us, right? And we can enjoy and engulf ourselves in there and we can indulge ourselves in our addiction. We can then take those little moments, those little moments right there where, where we allow ourselves to actually feel those emotions. So I knew that was going to have to be a part of it. So taking that as an idea, I went, memories, memories of this. And, that, and I went, memories of us. And my friend, he looks at me, he goes, memories of us. I go, yeah, think about it. Yeah. It's what we protect the most, memories of us. And we're going to be a grief support for men. So that's how that was birthed. Because when you think about it, women carry around pictures of their loved ones. Men carry around memories. Right. Women can pull out or the pictures, pictures and go, yeah, yeah. Do, do, do we pull out the pictures, right? And well, women will pull out the pictures and go, yeah, this is this is such and such and this and another. And what sparks the conversation between other women and you guys come together and support each other. When 
men, when we don't come together, we have those and we can protect those. We can hold those dear and we can let them out, but we have to make sure no one else is around. What I did is created a space. I wanted to create that space. So then. Do you think it weakens? Is it, is it the weakening feeling? Do you yes, think? It's, oh yeah, it's, so it's vulnerable. vulnerable. Yes. Yes. And, and you're so, absolutely right. It's that vulnerability. No man wants to be called less than a man. Right. You know what I'm saying? We got to be burly. That testosterone. We got to, you know, we got to, we got to suck it up. Right. You know what I'm saying? But deep down inside. Is killing us. But look what it did to you, though. Like, yeah. Um, if I can interject for a second, yes, because yes. your your idea and your concept that was brought to you when you were rock bottom, actually, you, you don't you don't stop thinking about your son, but it gave you a purpose mm -hmm. to it, focus it, on instead of the other negative part, right? Yeah. It, it, and it did because um, you know when you when you go through something tragic, you know, and it all depends on the person that you lose. I've met men who've had close relationships with their father, and when their father passed away, they've you know just fell apart. You know, even though they have all these other um, role models around, the father was yeah. the glue, you know, and so that's who they model behind. I've had men who was close to their mothers, same thing. Um, yeah brothers and sisters and you know children yeah the worst one is always the child right because as men you know if it's your daughter it's the it's the memory it's the thought of not seeing them get old not walking down the aisle not you know um missing out on all of those future adventures you know the first camping yeah. trip, the first heartbreak us men you know saying when it comes down to our daughters we look for that right because we're going you hurt my daughter we are the protector we're the ones that's going to scare you off when that's taken away you kind of lose a sense of who you are now you can have other kids and things like that and body's experience the father takes on a role of fixer we want to create a space to protect you. In turn, we neglect ourselves. Yeah. Right. When it comes down to relationships, if you're in a relationship um, and you lose a child, the man becomes the protector. Uh. We want to allow you the space to grieve. But in turn, what happens is that women often forget that um, we need to grieve too. So we want to take on the responsibility, take on the bills. We want to take on being the provider because that's our natural role of what society says that we need to be. So we can push our emotions off to our side. We, we want to make sure that you're safe. In turn, when we see you starting getting better, um, we, we look for that opening for us to be able to go and grieve. See, we don't grieve together right? Big mistake. The women has gotten so used to the men being a provider that when we go to them or when they're approached and go, hey, you know, I'm, I'm going to take some time to myself to, you know, I've already did this. So, we, you know, only thing I need you to do is just give me some space, be there for me. You know what I'm saying? Comfort me like I'm comforting you. Men don't say that, right? Deep down the side, we're thinking that. We want we want that comfort from you. Yeah. Um, and women go, well, what's wrong with you? I've heard this several times. And as crazy as it sounds, women do it subconsciously, not knowing it. But they I know. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we don't know, right? When, because now you're used to the role. Yeah. You're, you're used to us being a man. So now, you know, when that time comes, it's like, what is, what's wrong with what you? Do you mean? Something's bothering you? <laughs> yeah, what you mean something's bothering you? So men pull away. We pull away from my family. We pull away from my friends because our friends are already going, we don't know how to approach you, but we can go play basketball. You know, we can go, uh, uh, most men like video games, right? So it's it's a way to hide all of that stuff. Uh, it's a way to, you know, to escape that reality. But deep down inside, you know, it's a, it's a battle. It's an internal battle, not allowing ourselves to properly feel those emotions. What I found... Um in relation to that was that you feel that you're, um, you're, you're tired of acting, right? You're, you're tired. You get tired of being the strong visual outside person that you feel that you need to be, but you're this weakened thing 
gushiness inside that they, yeah. that no, you are you, trying to get control of. But yeah, you and you describe it right there. It's it's a gushy feeling that if you're a man uh, and not used to those emotions, it's it's a different feeling, right? Because you're like, no, no. So you fight it. First instinct yeah. is to fight it, right? Yeah. Um, so but when uh, with memories of us. Um, journey into to that is based off of all of that those emotions allowing myself uh, because i stopped i stopped allowing people to dictate how i should feel yes and it opened up the door not just for um those e those emotions for me to start allowing allowing myself to to cry allow myself to feel it to feel those emotions Right. And what happened is that on the other side of there, I realized there was a different sort of strength. There was a different sort of meaning of manhood um, yeah. because I was actually able to start conversating with other people. So then I went, you know, with this nonprofit, I want to see the differences between men and women. So I started observing people again for educational purposes and because I wanted to see how people, different people reacted. And they, yeah. they were people right around each other that didn't know that they were going through these processes and what they were doing. So consciously we go through them, right? So now I'm looking, I'm going, well, there's a difference. There's a, oh, wow. There's a huge difference. And I remember, and I, I remember looking back on the men that I was watching, our grieving process always looked the same. Yeah, we well, had said, similarities, right? <laughs> you know, the alcoholism, the coping mechanism where women, you know, yeah, you self-medicate for a little bit, but you're more susceptible to go around other women and sparks the conversation. I've had women tell me, man, if my girlfriend was to call me, I'm right there, right? Next thing you know, now you got a house full of women cooking, if cooking for you, doing your laundry, you know what I'm saying? Trying to take you out of this concept, whereas men, we find ourselves sitting, sitting in rooms by yeah. ourselves. You know, um, trying to trying to figure out how to get rid of the pain, and um, so and then coming out, walking around people like we're strong, you know. Right. And I think we need to stop that. We need to start opening up the conversations and being more honest with ourselves. More importantly, we have to get out of, get out of our own ways. And so, what I I always have told people in insurance world is that when you have life insurance, the money is wonderful. It's, it's great. And nobody's going to tell you, you know, you should have bought more because at that time, you know, you bought what you could for life insurance amount. But I always found it interesting that I always talk to people about when something happens, the male, for some reason, runs, you know, like the woman gets cancer or, or whatever tragedy comes. The men always, because they don't know how to deal with it. So you'll find some that get closer, you become closer together, and some that run the other direction. Yes. Um, and then I've gone to houses where I've brought a check for insurance, and they'll, they're, they're very sad, but at the same time, they're either really happy to show me this staging of the person's bedroom mm -hmm. that they kept that they don't want to touch. They want it left the way it was so that they have those memories. Mm -hmm. And then there's the other type of family that don't even want to be there anymore. They want yeah, something yeah. totally different. Exactly. So it's it's funny how we've, you know, everybody, and I, and I don't think anyone before it happens can tell you what they'll do because nobody knows. That's, that's very, very true. And it, it's funny that you say that because I was the runner. I, you know, no one, no one ever, never taught me that it was okay, um, okay to stay, mm -hmm. you know? So I, you know, when, when things got, got tough in my household and things like that, you know, my dad would leave, you know, and I always thought that he was protecting his peace. At least that's what I used to always tell myself. I still tell myself that, but I do it for different reasons now. So no one ever taught me about relationships. So in my mind was, you know, um, when it, when it came down to it, um, the relationship's supposed to be easy. You know, you find somebody that you, that you're good with, you know, um, you, and you, you're supposed to be right. You know what I'm saying? You, you find somebody that fits you 
and, and everything. And you develop this friendship. And then, you know, you develop this relationship. Nobody ever taught me about arguments. Well, I've seen arguments, right? And they never ended well. So I knew in my mind that, you know, I, if we argue, you know, no, no, I'm not, not I'm not going to do this. You know, like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to, I don't want to do the whole arguing thing. Um, but that comes from a lifetime of um, just trauma, tragedy. You know, I knew that I wanted peace at some point in my life. So no one ever taught me that when you're in a relationship, it's going to take some work to get to know this person. Right. And uh, so I figured it would better. It was it was better that I stayed alone. Yeah. You know, it was it was easier for me uh, instead of putting people through the tr that tragedy, that heartbreak and things like that. It was easier for me to move on um, because so many people had done it to me. No one really stayed around. So. I spent a lot of my life alone and moving around, not allowing people to get to know me. Six months here, you know, four months there, uh, you know, no matter where I went. Yeah. And uh, so I was very closed off, very, very closed off from people. Um, and again, due to the life I've lived, you know, being in a gang for almost 20 years, well, over 20 years, you know, you, you, you see people die all the time. You see, um, I've watched people, friends that I knew or people that I thought were friends uh, commit suicide. Um, I've, I've seen those same people, you know, that was that um, used to be considered one of the, you know, the bad dudes on the streets, you know, knock you out, shoot you up and things like that. I saw those same same guys become drug addicts, um, even in prison, you know, even in prison, those same, those same guys. Uh, I, I've, I've just seen so much that I knew I didn't want to be a part of it anymore. Yeah. And these same people that I was close to were the same ones um, that tried to kill me, you know? Um, and again, you know, it's, it just comes from a life, life of not being able to trust the people that I'm around. So when well, it came I down to relationships, it was easier for me to leave. I, I, I didn't know how to trust. I didn't know how to open up. And um, so I spent a lot of time apologizing to people because I didn't understand that, you know, it wasn't them. It was me. So you were the perfect date that said, it's not you, it's me. <laughs> if I if I even said that, believe it or not, you know, uh, even if, if even if I said that, and I've ruined a lot of lot of relationships. Um, I hurt a lot of people in my path. So karma only fairly comes back and gets me, you know, and, and goes, This is what you've been doing. So I, I spend a lot of times, you know, it's funny how life works out. You, you meet the, you see these people down the line, they are married and, you know, saying have kids, they're happy and, and things like that. And, um, but there's, you know, that you, this is what you have to do yeah. in order for you to get some sort of peace, you know? So I spend a lot of my time going to them and say, Hey, you know, I don't know if you remember me and um, they do because when you hurt someone like that, they remember the pain, but it's a different feeling when you go to them and go, Hey, you know, back then I have to apologize. I did not know that um, that I wasn't supposed to do that to you because I use everything that happened to me as an excuse. So I owe you a deep apology. You didn't deserve that. And I'm glad to see you doing well. And at some point you can forgive me. It doesn't have to be now, but if you do, I appreciate it. But if not, I appreciate that as well. That's really so, lovely. Yeah. So, and then moving forward, uh, moving forward into this life, taking those, taking that um, lone wolf mentality yes. and, and building a nonprofit, stepping outside of my comfort zone, because I'm a big time introvert, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge at being, I'm, I'm good at it. You know, I'm good at avoiding people. I'm good at not talking to anyone, except for now. So way outside of my mm -hmm. comfort zone. Um, to being the person that I am standing in front of you, doing what I'm doing, and uh, actually understanding that every step that I've taken, everything that I've gone through was part of this process yes. that put me on this goal of saying, of knowing exactly what I'm supposed to do now. But seeing across the board, taking my grieving process and identifying it as the stages of grief. So I, I started looking at this and I went, you know, I'm going to do grief support for men. But I don't want to neglect my community, you know, cause now I'm in a community, you know, I built something. Yeah. 
And right. I'm looking at the people in the community. What did I go through? Addiction. That's part of that's part of this. Part of it. So I need somebody to come in and do recovery groups, mm -hmm. right? And then I started looking at it again. I'm good. I went, what else did I struggle with? Mental health. What did that look like to me? Well, this is what it looked like. So I started bringing in, uh, I started partnering with another group, the Alliance of Suicide Prevention. And I started um, going, I need a mental health, a men's mental health group. But not just that, since we understand the differences, I need a woman to come in to do women's mental health. So I did. I partnered with two other, other um, two organizations to do that. Then I started looking at the vets, you know, and I'm going, it, yeah, I may not be a vet, but they still go through the grieving process. They just see it from a different perspective, right? So I need someone who can talk to our veterans so we can get them help too. So I did, right? And then I started thinking, what was the final step for me? Suicide. How has that affected those around me? So now the picture, the, the broader spectrum has started to crack itself open. Now these things are starting to make sense. I need a, I need someone in to do suicide prevention or not just suicide prevention because sometimes we we don't get to them in time. Yes. So what's left with the survivors? Where do we go? I need someone to come in to support those survivors. So now these different areas started to open up. I started looking at the women and, and realizing that they've been victimized within their homes by the men who are going through the grieving process, but got stuck in the anger, not having the outlet. Their family becomes the outlet. They, be, they tend to abuse them and, and vice versa, right? I've seen, I've been yeah. in an abusive relationship with, with a woman before, you know, and the worst relationship I've ever had. <laughs> oh, wow, you know. <laughs> Okay, we're gonna open up that can of worms. No, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, my son's mother, um, believe it or not, um, she was very abusive. She was what you would call a true narcissist, right? And at that me at that time, I never knew what a narcissist was, you know, because I've always spent time by myself. I knew I wasn't gonna let no one just take that away from me. Unfortunately, when I met her, she was very beautiful very kind at the time. And we met at a time where I was in my alcoholism, uh, I, my alcoholic stage, you know, and I was at a bar. Couldn't dance worth nothing, but a few drinks in me, I cut a rug with you. And I was a, I was very promiscuous, right? So a lot of one night stands with me and I ended up meeting her. Something to myself, you know, we're gonna go have some fun, you know? And um, she, just kind of stuck around and grew on me. <laughs> so the one night stand ended up becoming more of, you know, um, a continual, continuous thing. And um, I was going, okay, all right, we're going to try this. She was older than me. And I went, maybe she has herself together. Um, we we're both Leos. And so that's, that's not a good combination when it comes to that. No. For the Leos out there that, that make it work, Man, kudos not to you. <laughs> not, in, not in my house. Because by her being the older, she always thought that she, you know, was the alpha female. And I went, mm -mm, uh uh, no. So that whole animal button head type things, right? And uh, so then she would go, well, you're going to, I'm not, not going to do that. I'm just as stubborn as you, you know. But what came after that is just that she had a mean streak. And once I got to know more about her, she was already pregnant, you know, so I'm, I'm making excuses for her. I'm, you know, and, and it's just not getting any better. It got to a point to where I slept downstairs on a couch for almost two years just to avoid. And we lived in the same household, paid bills. I just stayed downstairs and, uh, you know, we would torture get together. Yeah. Well, no, it wasn't torture. It wasn't really torture. It was like, I, I don't know if she's going to kill me in my sleep. <laughs> type thing, you know, so craziness, right? Because I'm like, and her kids are like, my mom, is there something wrong with my mother? I'm like, no one warned me? Wow. <laughs> well, again, we're all stupid at some point. Yeah, right? so again, my choose is broken, right? So so I've been in I've been in that abusive relationship worst two years. This woman degraded me to a point to where I lost my self-worth. Um and she made me really, yeah. really afraid of women. And I went, 
No. So I avoided women for the better part of maybe five years. I have female friends and stuff like that, but nothing on that level. Um, we was we were just friends and, and things. So they got to watch that side of that side. And they used to always go, Tony, you got to get away from this crazy woman. And I go, I know I try. She stalked me. She's got me evicted out of my apartments, two apartments, as a matter of fact, got, got two of my cars repossessed. She's got me fired from four jobs. Um, oh uh, she's called the police on me as she was stalking me walking down the street. And I still couldn't tell you how that one even persisted. I mean, it was a constant thing with her, even after we separated. So now I take take all of that, these life experiences, right? Life can teach you these beautiful things. You can so laugh going, later. Yes, you can. Yeah. Oh, and I did. I learned, I learned, but I learned in a way to where it benefits me. My curiosity yeah. just opened up these doors. So, uh, and so now we have a women's domestic violence group. We're working on bringing in a men's, um, the men's, a men's domestic violence group. So we, we're covered across the board. Awesome. Now, yeah. So now, uh, now it's triggered back my passion of, of personal training again, right? Because a huge part of my healing or allowing myself to heal was yeah. um, finding something like the physical aspect. So now I use my personal training and I offer my services for free to the men in my group. You know, I, I, if if you feel, if you look good, you feel good. You keep those yeah. feel good endorphins going on, right? It's part of the healing process, but not just that. The main point of, of of the main point that we tend to neglect is our spiritual aspect yeah so a huge part of my spiritual journey and reconnecting to what i'm doing in this world and understanding more of what is required from me uh and having a better a more stronger relationship with with god yeah. um, has helped me connect and he goes you know and i looked at my personal trainer i went i'm going to rebuild my personal training company and i did and became very successful at it. So now I'm to a point to where I can offer my services for free to the guys in the group. I don't have to charge them. But now we look at the spiritual aspect. Another part of that is, is um, for me, has been meditation and yoga. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to, I want to explore more of my spirit. I want to, I, I want to let my spirit dance. And what I mean by that, I want, I want to be guided along this path. See, when you're when you're following that purpose, your spirit starts to skip. Mm -hmm. Nothing can get you down. No challenge, no nothing, because now you're pursuing the thing, one thing that you're supposed to do. And that's what I feel like on a day to day basis. Now, you know, I get up um, and, and everything and it's like my spirit just goes, let's play. And that takes so much weight off of you, it doesn't does. it? It does. You feel it, like so light and yeah. like you have a purpose and. It is. I know what I'm supposed to do in this world now. And all of these different platforms, I managed to to grow to a point to where I couldn't even explain it with the people okay. that I work with across the board. Now, when COVID hit, you know, I was still in the process of trying to look for an office space, right? COVID hit, things shut down. I would have to say COVID helped me, right? It, for one, it helped expose the things that people are hiding. It brought, brought it out to the forefront. Yeah. So I brought more of a need of these services across the board. And it made us adapt how we approach things. So now we're not doing in-person, people are quarantined. How do we reach these people? Better yet, how do we keep, um, keep that connectiveness with each other during this time of need? So- yeah. One door opens, right? Uh, yeah. I get a call, um, and this is uh, another um, people that I'm partnering with, which is House and Neighborly Services. They go, "Hey, we have an office space. If you're still interested, why don't you come over?" So at the beginning of the pandemic, I had blocked out everything. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, at that time, uh, and if this if this person is listening to this, she's going to kill me um, <laughs> because. <clears throat> When when I when I got called to do this and develop this thing, I was dating a person and there was a connection with her. When a pandemic hit, I told her, I'm gonna need some space to work. So I pushed her off on the back on the on the back burner. And she and we just stopped talking. Now I didn't, it wasn't personal. It was going, 
I don't need any distractions at the moment. And you're going to be a strong distraction. And hopefully after all of this, you're still around. Um, if it's meant to be, it will be. If it's meant to be. But I took that time and I worked my butt off to get to where I am. So my 24 hours changed. You know, I started, I, I went, you know, I need a job that keeps me up at night mm -hmm. because I'm going to go to school and I'm going to get my master's to become a grief counselor. So right now I just give support. I'm not a grief, grief counselor whatsoever. Um, so I, I maximize my 24 hours, sleep four hours, work 20. So now I have this opportunity to have this office space. I brought all of these people in, which now we've grown into a bigger office space to where, you know, it, it just, it just, it just all evolved. It just all evolved. Right. And so now we, we're, we're adapting, we're doing um, in-person one-on-ones, uh, which is safer and everything. So we still offering that peer support and everything we've we've strengthening up our virtual platforms across the board um and we're uh we're now venturing off into the community but now we we just got a different playing yeah. field we got yeah. zoom now right you know yeah. so uh, it, watching everything grow the way that it has um has been the best journey in the world. Now it that, it did come with prices, you know. And as they say, and if, when if you listen to motivationals, they always tell you along those journeys, you're gonna have to make those sacrifices. Absolutely. You know? so it did. You know, I I went through I went through getting my vehicle reapers. That's because I believed in what I I believe in what I'm doing um, so much. I went. You yeah. know what? That's an that's an extra expense. I don't need that. Mm -hmm. It's not like. Um, I was behind or anything just during the pandemic things just got wild yeah and i was yeah I, I, and one day I, I i was going to work and they came up and told me they was coming to repossess my vehicle i went how in the world i just paid you guys where well, the payments got lost right so now they got my vehicle so i looked at it and i went this is not the first time i've been through this it's one bump in the road. So I realized that's one challenge i'm not even going to take it personal right i'm, I'm not going yeah. to do it i'm not going to take it personal um and then, you know, um, having to sacrifice sleep. I went, I'm sacrificing my sleep because of what I'm working for. I see the benefit. If I right. can dedicate X amount of time to do this, you know, and X amount of time to do this, which allows that window open for me to go to school, um, get these certifications, um, learn more about this journey of grief that I'm on. I want to learn more about it, right? And so that's what that allows me to do. <clears throat> Bringing it to the next level. Taking it, to, you're absolutely yeah. right. Taking it to the next level. I want to understand so much about it to where if I'm sitting in a group and someone comes in, I want to be able to have that empathy, mm -hmm. that understanding, but just, and having that openness um, to be there in that moment with them, you know? And I always have a saying, no matter what your tragedy is, you have one moment that change your life, but you may have 15 days, 15 seconds, 15 years, or maybe longer. That is enough. Mm -hmm. So we build upon that within a group. Like this is enough. What other memories do you have? So memories of us, right? We share those memories, right? We share those journeys and, and things like that. And you'd be surprised um, when men open up, you know, they, we go through tissue all the time, especially across Zoom. So now we have this different platform and now we can we can reach people across the globe, which we have, um, yeah. which brought in more networking opportunities with people in California. And the beautiful part in that, about it is, is now down I'm starting to see more men support groups open, you know, pop up. And I'm going, hey, we should work together across the board. You're in California. Yeah. I'm in Colorado. You were in Texas. Let's let's work together across the board. Let's let's bring these about because if a person can't, if a man can't get to my group, um, I want to be able to have those resources and say, hey, there's other groups across the board. You guys should check them out. So networking with these people um, has that been a challenge? Yeah, because they they think that we're in competition with one another. I don't want to mm -hmm. uh, comp compete with no. you. I want to work with you because. Yeah. We can together, we can make a bigger impact. So now I'm venturing off. Now we have, now I have these uh, men's and women's support groups across the board and things like that. Um, and I'm diving deeper into this journey, 
you know, this process, you know, and I'm enjoying it every step of the way. And to look at what we're doing now, it only made sense. I went, you know, after having conversations with women, right. And, and the biggest thing, I knew something was missing. The biggest thing that was missing was that women still didn't understand. They, they still had no comprehension of what men were going through. So I went, I want to start a podcast and I want to have men come on and share these stories about their struggles, but I want it raw, uncut and unfiltered. And it opened up the doors. Mm -hmm. It really did. It, it most now women come up and go, now I get it. I see it now just through this conversation with him. But also other men, um, because the challenge was getting more men to come into the group, you know, yeah. and getting us to open up. So, you know, there was times no one showed up except for one person. And then there was times that I was the only one in the group. So I had a good conversation with myself. Um, <laughs> 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 these things happen. OK, so it's mm -hmm. yes, it's it's definitely a struggle. And people still t um, before they realized what I was doing, um, they, they still mm -hmm. doubted me. They went, it's hard to get men to open up. It's hard to get men to open up. And I went, challenge accepted. Challenge accepted. I, you wait right there for a minute. I'm, I got to try this for a bit, right? So what the podcast has done is open up those conversations. So now I see more, more men start to come to the group, you know, and they kind of teeter-totter in, in and out and everything. But what it did is that now they started seeing these everyday ordinary men walking down the street that you've seen on my podcast and they're they're walking up to these guys and going your story helped me you know um to understand that i'm not alone you're not alone that's the first thing you need to understand you're yeah, not alone that's for sure <clears throat> secondly your life is going to life is going to challenge you there's no way around that and there is hope so that's what we do with the podcast and with these support groups is that we provide hope uh, to these individuals by bringing mm -hmm. these stories by, you know, um, and now that the groups are being more diverse, you know, I have, I'm not, I'm starting to see an increase in the women guests and everything that talk to our male audiences uh, about their experiences, because, you know, believe it or not, there's a lot more, um, um, men support groups ran by women oh. uh, <laughs> that are popping up across the uh, uh, across the board. And I'm going. We need to work together um, um, because I, 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 I get what you're doing, but what's going to happen is that you're going to end up with more women in your group, and you're going to defeat the purpose of what you're trying to do. Yeah. So let's work together, and let us deal with the men. Let us deal with the men. They can relate to us a lot more, right? Yeah. You know, and that way you, you're going to fall into the, you're going to fall back into it anyway, but your group is going to become an all women's group. We see it all the time, right? The women come in yeah. and, the, and the men close up. Now, yeah. I, I, before they close up, before they get out of your group, how about you use the resources that we have and kind of encourage your men to come this way? You know, I appreciate what you're trying to do, stepping outside your box, but let us let us do that and yeah. let us work together because I have women that will enjoy coming to your group, you know, and, and things like that. So um, and now with the men's group that are strictly, you know, coming up with men, um, they're starting to stand their ground and they're starting to talk to the females. Um, so I have these women in on my podcast and everything, but they do bring a different sort of perspective about grief, right? Uh, and their education about it and the journey that got them there. So right. now, now those doors are opening up and, and it's a beautiful thing. It and sure so, is. Yeah. And uh, so now we have the, we have the YouTube channel that's coming about. Right. And um, so now people can put faces to those, to those stories. Mm -hmm. And I've had some beautiful stories, right? I've, um, the, one of the first stories was a, a lady who became a peer um, recovery coach, started her own nonprofit, but also dealt with the, what 
the suicide of her husband, her own drug addictions, um, going to prison, wow. federal prison for six years, right? So it opened up the audience on that end, on that end well, because men look at her recovery groups and they're going, they're more susceptible to go there, right? Yeah, and and seek that, seek that help because now you have a woman in front of you that have been where you are. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it kind of it kind of starts to mingle in. It opens up that conversations because now you're in a group. Um, and that's one of the one of the few groups that I've seen that happen where the men were more comfortable going in and talking about their recovery instead of being separated. But to be able to provide that opportunity, those options is a beautiful thing. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, that is, is just beautiful. And um, I see. Beautiful. Yeah, I've, I've, I've heard. Um, stories of um, men who were sex trafficked um, d- throughout their life. So now that brings a different perspective to, you know, the human sex trafficking thing that we have going on nowadays, that it's not just women. And the it's, healing, uh, the healing that goes with that. Right, right. And because uh, it lets other men know um, that that they're, that they're, they're not by themselves, right? But yeah. now we have a different problem when it comes to that as well. Like, where do our men end up at? You know, we hear about the female sex trafficking victims, but we don't hear about the men. Or do we? We actually do. And um, my friend, uh, my friend, my dear friend, Sean, he's the one who brought this perspective to me because he shined this light on it. Um, He goes, the men sex trafficking victims are what you see as pedophiles. Oh, Think about that for a minute, right? Think about that. Women are victims. They're survivors. The men, they, they're out there, but they become pedophiles. What happens and what, what, what happens is that when they're being sexually abused their whole entire life, men, when we go when they go to, to the families and say, this is what's going on, no one believes us, right? But if a young girl was to go and do it, now the whole family has to come together to go beat up on this dude. But now you put this young man back in a position to where he can't escape. You pretty much handed him back to the to the people that's doing it. Well, as they get older, they it becomes a habit. They know exactly you know no one tells them that is wrong. Yeah, no one tells them you, that get, is wrong. you get null to it. It's it's like. Right. So they know how to perform now. These men know how to, you know, they've been taught how to groom other kids. This this has become their life. So then when they get old enough, they, you know, the people that have been doing it, they go, well, you're too old. We don't need you anymore. We want fresher meat, right? We want to go yeah. back and get the younger ones. So they kick them out. And so these now these men are out here in the society that they don't understand. What they do is that they go back to what they know. They know how to groom. They know that this is where their source of affection has come from, you know, and as tragic as it may seem. Whether it's right or wrong. Whether it's right or wrong. Well, no one ever told them, taught them that it was wrong. No. So they go back to doing what they, what they know how because they're looking for a sense of purpose, a sense of belonging, and this is what they know. When said family members hear about what's going on, now they got to go beat up on this guy, right? And, the, and when the police come, the police are already upset. You just did this. That I'm, not that I'm taking up for them. I'm just giving a different perspective of them. Right. You know, because um, I, I don't believe in, you know, I don't believe that we should hurt our children or our women in no way whatsoever, for them ever. Right. But sometimes it's happened and we have to have perspective about it. So when these guys get caught by the police, the first thing they say, what did I do wrong? And they go, well, this is what you did. Hold on. So you telling me that it was that what what was going on with me was wrong this whole time. Then where were you at to protect me? So now they got to go to jail. No one wants to hear that, right? You know what I'm saying? They right. don't believe you. They just think that you're a sick-minded individual, not not, not understanding that you you don't understand. You, you don't get it. You don't get that it's wrong. No one protected you. So now you put them in prison, right? And in prison they don't last long because in prison they yeah. don't have no understanding of that. They just know that this is what you're here for. So they go through that time being abused. They go through that time being, you know, um, beat up, traded around all of these things for what you've done. So he brought that perspective to me. Um, and then, you know, the mental health. It's pretty aspect. deep. 
Yeah, it, it, it's it, it, when you when you think about trauma, trauma has a lot of different levels, right? It takes you, you have to actually open up your mind to these things do happen, mm-hmm. and sometimes what you what you, your perception of what's going on is not it's not actually what's going on. So having to take a different approach and understand that sometimes people need help, sometimes. Um, they need a hand up. They need somebody to understand from from their perspective, and yeah. that's what these different people, you know, that I'm that I'm working with across the board. They brought different perspectives about what they do, which has also helped me along my spiritual journey, because yeah. now I'm more determined to do what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm more determined to go into these neighborhoods why these you know and i noticed this a lot and i'm not down talking to any other nonprofit. i think their work is good i just think that we need to do a better job of working together at doing what we're doing uh, and focus on our communities so what i found that is that a lot of bigger nonprofits stayed outside of the communities and i realized their target was the people who could afford their services whereas you know the people inside of the communities were the ones struggling the most mm-hmm. and i wanted to provide opportunities and services to where they didn't have to worry about you know paying for it you know my payment is watching them come back right the, you know and, time and, and, after time right time after time so i i wanted to have all of these things in one spot and i I've, I've done that that's awesome I, yeah and so I want the communities to know that, you know, stop by, get the, get the healing that you need, you know, and it's only thing we asking for, bring, bring your trauma with you, whatever that looks like, bring that trauma with you, you know, whether if it's your, your addiction, yeah. mental health, bring it. We, we want you to bring it because we want you, we, we, we don't want you to carry that burden, but you know, we want you to know that there's hope and that there's people out there that is, that are willing yeah. to walk with you right where you are we're like we're not trying to get you to step outside of your comfort zone we want to come inside of your comfort zone and help and walk with you as you step outside of that to explore your own healing to explore your own path to get that connection that you that you're craving uh, and be with more no judgment and and su- exactly. support yeah and and that's the biggest part you know having that without without that judgment without that support um, um you know, um, negative um, feedback on you. We want you to be where you are and we want to come there where you are Mm -hmm. because this is not a one size fit all. Whatever that path looks like, let's walk together. You know, let's let's rebuild our communities. Let's rebuild the people in our communities by helping them heal, helping them get out of that cloud and uh, understanding that, you know, these things happen. Yes. if you want it, there's something better on the other side. You just have to put in the work and surrender to to the process that's going to become the new you. So it's a process of rediscovering who you're becoming. You know who you are, right? You know who you've been. Let's meet the person who's waiting for you at the other end of that, you mm-hmm. know, because they're they're waiting for you. But we have to we have to get past all of that. We have to address all of these issues and find your strength, you know, find your voice in, in this journey. Find you. Find you again. Yeah. I think we lose ourselves, that's for sure, through grief of all sorts and trauma. Oh. It, it's it's crazy. Um, and just to go back to um, you trying to come to terms with your ex- son's mom um i'm not sure what to title her as <laughs> uh, she's, she's a woman right you know what i'm saying so so just to go back to that because in the planning process that i talk about in my podcast all the time is that you are going to have something that happens to you everybody yes. everybody at some point yeah and yes you're absolutely right and it coincides with your work right yeah, it coincides with it. And that's I, I love that because if I would have known that this was around before all of this was going on, I would have loved to have those extra moments with my family, you know, yeah. and not have to worry about it, you know, and 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 
to have everything in one spot and go, you know, I know this is going on right now, but this is already taken care of. So beauty. Yes. <laughs> I, I would love to have a backup plan or someone to help me have a backup plan. Um, because if I would have known that, um, my son's mother would have taken, uh, taken me along the roller coaster ride the way that she did, I would have loved to have someone in my corner, um, going, don't worry about this right here. We got this focus on this over here, you know? And so I think that's really, really important. Um, because who can, I mean, who can even think about the, the, the regular everyday stuff when you're going through that? Your mind, you know what I try to explain to people when you have something happen to you? It's like your brain is outside of your head. Yes. And, and it's, it's like you have to almost grab it and pull it back and put it back into your head and say, okay, now I got to think, okay, now it's going back out again. Okay. I got to pull it back in, <laughs> and I'll put it back in my head. Oh yeah. I don't know how to explain it, but that's the only way I can explain what you feel like. And in so many ways, yes, that's exactly what it feels like because your brain is trying to take you in a different direction to where the grief is trying to take you, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, your brain has created scenarios. It's created a way to keep you busy, right? So you, you automatically come up. And we don't, we don't, we don't really think about the, having a backup plan, right? We just live in that moment. Yeah. So who, who really plans for, for grief? Nobody. Uh, and, nobody. And I'm going to ask you this before I forget. What should we say to, to a man? who is grieving? How do we say something meaningful and heartfelt? You don't. You don't. You don't. When it comes down to men, if this is, if this is someone that you love and care about, there's no words that's going to um, take away what's going on. So you do it by actions. The one thing that a man will accept is a hug from someone that they care about. That hug speaks volumes. It speaks volumes because it lets that per it lets that man know that you see him. You see what he's going through. You've you've seen it, right? That hug, you know what I'm saying? Because we are physical beings. That hug lets me know that you see me. It lets me know that, you know what I'm saying? That I don't have to say a word. You feel, you feel my pain. You see what I'm going through. That hug is going to let, allow me to shed a tear. It's going to allow me to bring you in Open closer up. to me. Yeah. And I'm going to hold you for as long as I can. As long it, as you allow me. Because I was going to say, my answer to that was going to be, I would hug the person and say, I'm here for you. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm feeling you. I I feel your pain. Yeah. That's and, what that, that's what that hug says. Yeah, exactly. Now, those words that you say right there, that's what that hug means to, mm -hmm. to that grieving man. Now, if you have a man that understands what you're going through, you get that hug to him. It's a sense of, man, how did you get through it? And you feel a certain bond between one another. Mm -hmm. Even though we don't say too much, you know what I'm saying? It, when we back <laughs> off, we look at each other and we shake our hand like this. It's like, yeah, thank you for that. And you tend to run across them from time to time, right? And yeah. it always begins and ends with the same thing. You pull each other in. Hey, how you doing, man? That hug right there lets me know because I can feel your heartbeat. Mm -hmm. But not just that. I can I can feel that emotion coming off of you. It's a sense of relief. It's a sense of support, right? Now, right. can you imagine having a support group based around that around feeling? That. That's what I wanted to create it. What, what I wanted to create with Memories of Us. I wanted to create that feeling that you're not alone. You feel this right here? You feel you feel that? You're not, you're not by yourself, man. You know what I'm saying? You don't have to walk this by yourself. Right. I want you to feel this strength. Whatever strength I have in me, I want you to pull off of it. You know what I'm saying? It's yours. 
it's just that with you. So when we're doing these groups and everything, we're having these conversations, that's what it's like. It's us sharing that little bit of strength that we have and allowing ourselves to be stronger within our emotions by allowing ourselves to feel those emotions. Because when a man starts crying, the first thing we do is to go, go ahead, man, let that out, man. You could cry yeah, when you're drunk. Yeah, you know, you, hey, man, let that out. Let that, and we may talk trash too. Like, man, go ahead and let that out now, man. You know, like, it, you don't need to be carrying that. And it usually leads into a story of how that came about, right? It, it's something that's triggering that emotion. And they, man, I was, I was, I was, uh, I was riding in the car today and I heard this song, man, and it, it reminded me of my significant other. Or, you know what I'm saying? Today I drove past um, um, this, this store and it, you know what I'm saying? It reminded me of a time where, you know, I was with my brother and my sister that's not here right now. It triggers as an emotion. When you're inside of that group, that's where it comes out. That's that's where that true bonding comes together. Mm -hmm. That's where we start to feed off each other. Then the conversation changes. Like we talk about grief, yes. We talk about grief, but we focus more on the memories. We get the laughing and you know what I'm saying? We remember those moments from when we were kids with them and all of these different aspects of it, man. They, we, we tell jokes to one another and um, we look forward to the next one. Mm -hmm. We look forward to the next one. And to me, that's the best feeling that, in the world. The best. That's the best feeling in the world. The second best is when you have a man that has been coming to your groups that's battling, that has battled with the, the loss of a loved one, right? And they have a significant other. And you have that significant other. And I've had this happen to me. Walk up to me in a grocery store and have this guy in my group introduce us. That person don't say a word. They just come up and go, I don't know what you did, but I appreciate you. Mm -hmm. Because now the man that's in front of me lets me in. Right? And they come right. up and they hug. They, they hug me and I'm going, I, I didn't do anything. I, I did I did nothing at all. I just created a space for you to be able to explore and find that, find that. And you came up with the rest of it. So I'm it's 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 not me it's it's not me it's it's them it's their want to want to heal you yeah know? It's, yeah and wanting to, wanting to talk and creating that space up there allows for them to do that it allows for them to drop that burden off and, and explore those different aspects and getting back to the new normal of their life you know yeah. we gotta you know you can't change what's happened no you can't yeah but you can take it with you. You can tend to do things that that still brings you joy, right? That you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying. And you can have, you can still have that that heartbeat again, right? You know what I'm saying. And you can also have that different connection on the other side, because you've gotten to a place to where, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm yeah. going to walk this path. But what we don't realize is that every time we do it, every time we do something that brings us joy, we release a part of them which brings a sense of peace, right? Well, it's a positive release. It's Yeah. It, yeah. You're you're growing, I guess. Yeah. It's very very deep, very intellectual, very it's it's crazy. It really is. And and it's just so wonderful to talk to you about other people as well as yourself and the and the journey that we have to go through yeah. um it's unfortunate that we have to learn learn the hard way i don't know why we do but yeah. our lessons have have told us that unfortunately some are good lessons and some aren't so nice to us where we really have to dig ourselves out of um it feels like quicksand sometimes yeah yeah i i, I told a friend of mine um and it's funny that you say the quicksand. I used a hole, right? <laughs> um, as as I was going through my grief journey, it felt as if I fell down this deep hole, right? And I'm trying to find a way up. Now, every side is smooth. There's no way for me to climb back up. And I felt that if there was somebody up on top that kept dropping down the rope, and every time I went to go grab it, they were they, shortening. Yeah. You know? And they just kept doing it. And, you know, the more and more I kept doing it, the more and more I kept feeling like they kept kicking dirt over top of me. So 
I started looking at everything. Now I'm down inside of this hole. It's a dark place. I'm in a really, really bad place right now. I'm looking for a lifeline. And I'm going, you know, and I, I remember calling out the guy to go, can you throw me a lifeline or something? You know, like, yeah, how many holes something. are you going to drop me down, right? Something, something. Yeah. give me something, give right? Me something. <laughs> yeah. so I feeling like he was up at top, looking down on me, kicking dirt over top of me, going, you're going to have to figure this one out. And I'm going, well, there's a rope. And if you drop it down a little bit, I can climb out. You know, I have no problems with climbing. I just give me some tools. So I kept throwing dirt over top of me. Then I realized that the dirt kept getting higher. The rope just kept going up. So every time I jumped, it kept kicking dirt down there, right? So every part of those steps were was a different version of that grief journey. Then it got to a point, I realized what he was doing. He goes, use what's around you and climb out. You don't need the rope. You just have to learn how to pack that down and make it solid. So every step is a better foundation. Right. It was it's just a different version of that of that journey. And then I got to the point to where once I was standing over top of it, God was sitting there and he had the whole rope the whole time. He goes, I could have gave you the rope and made it real easy for you to get out of this hole. But what purpose would that have given you? Mm -hmm. What I've done is that I took the dirt that was in the hole and I put it back in and I, and I forced you to pack it down to understand that you don't have to be down there. Everything that you need, I've already provided for you, you know? And so I go, <laughs> I, I just, I just look at him and just go like this, like, you know, I wish you could have just sent me an email. Yeah, just know. kind of told me that. Give me yeah, a heads up. Sent a text message <laughs> and, and and things like that. And so, that. <laughs> right. So you know, people go, God has a sense of humor. Yeah, if you would have saw what he did, <laughs> <laughs> you know. But being standing up on top of that hole, I realized I like that. that. Yeah, it, it's full now, right? It's not a hole anymore. It's not a hole anymore. Um, that's really interesting because I had a similar experience, but it was I didn't have a hole. I had a room and it was just black, a black mm. room. And I couldn't see any light in any like where are the doors? Where where is a door with light? Yeah, I exactly I have to find the light. And yes, I couldn't. Yes. And then one day I saw a little bit of light around a doorway. I'm like, oh, okay. So th that's kind of similar. It was just a different, different way of looking at it. But yeah, I, I love the concept because it's it's very similar. Actually, if you think about the hole, it's a dark place, right? I can see yeah. up on top. It's not yeah. a whole lot of light. Yours was a room that you saw the light. Of, you're of yeah, yeah, it's funny. You know, along this journey, you know, the people that we run across with similar stories, you know, yeah. similar experiences that has helped us manifest who we are, who we mm -hmm. truly authentically are, right? right? Right. And you know, when we when we think about the challenges and the and the and the path that we on, would you have had it any other way? Well, you know, at the time, yeah. <laughs> um, but after when you see such a bigger picture. Yeah. It, it, it all kind of falls into place, but I guess the only thing that I would ever tell somebody that's listening, that's perhaps grieving or going through trauma is like your story. Um, like you don't want anybody to say it's gonna be okay because you don't believe mm -hmm. that when you're in it. Um, but to think that if someone said to you, listen, Tony, you're going to go through a lot of obstacles. There's going to be a lot of challenges up ahead because you're just down at this bottom of the hole <laughs> that you have to kind of get the ladder and to go back up. But it's going to be so beautiful. Yes. It's, it's going to be so amazing. And it's, it's going to be fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. No one ever told me that, right? Nobody told me that. But in a sense, in a sense, when we embark on this journey, we have a belief 
that something better is on the other side. So it kind of changes the perspective as we're going through this, right? Are right. you willing to take the next step? Are you willing to, to sacrifice people's opinions to walk through the doors that you're supposed to, right? Not right. because they approve, because you know that there's what's on the other side, you feel that it's better than what you're going through. So mm -hmm. that's what drove me. You know, that's that's what still drives me, right? Yeah. I go, I go, there's something on the other side of this. I need to see what's on the other side, you know? And my curiosity just went, let's do it then. So I look back on all the challenges and the, how the road was. And, right. you know, I, I started telling myself, I was listening to a, a, a motivational by David Goggins and he said something that I, could, that I could relate to at the time. He goes, your life that, you know, the life that he lived throws a whole lot at you, you know? And I, and I felt that. I, I really truly felt that. And I went, you know, so I kind of use it sometimes. I go, you know, the life that I lived, if you walked in it, you know, you would understand, but I don't take nothing for granted. My life has humbled me to a point to where I understand a lot more. Uh, and it's making me more driven to want to pursue it more, you know, yeah. because I just see the different, I, th that vision. I know where I'm going. You know, I can see it right there. But I just don't know how I'm supposed to get there. <laughs> and but it's not the how that concerns us. Yeah. No. It's it's the journey. It's being able to tell the story of getting to where you get. So I always tell people my story, I'm a nobody. And I've always told people that I'm a nobody, but I'm about to make a huge impact in this world. Yes. So I and I've embarked on this journey. I'm not stopping. You're this year I find my land. Yeah, you're right. I'm I'm immersed in this. I'm immersed in seeing, um, seeing helping my community. And I'm immersed in being better, being a better version of me. Yeah. And and educating others and and working with others, and because I can see the the applications, I can see the value in it. That's why I don't look at money. I I see the value in it, you know, and the value is not just for me. It's for those that are around us. It's for our communities, you know what I'm saying? It's for our right. families and our friends and things like that. We have to be examples um, and, and we have to be a glimmer of hope for them as well. You know, but somebody has to have a lifeline. Yes. We have to be that lifeline from everything to doing support groups to having a backup plan, planning ahead to make sure that, you know, saying you have your ducks in a row so you right. can have those, you can have those extra precious moments with your loved ones. That you know? you're not going to regret after. Right, right, exactly. Because sometimes those precious moments could be a day or an hour or a year or two years or four years or. Exactly. You can, you can have 15 seconds. You 15 know, we, years. It, or 15 yeah. years, right? But, but unless the, but you the, actually realize that, mm -hmm. how precious those moments are. Mm -hmm. But it takes some some getting getting through the messiness of it yes. to actually see the blessings in those moments that you have with them. And once you can grab on to a moment that made you smile, yeah. that made you laugh, that made you angry with that person, you know what I'm saying? That you've lost, you realize that it's it's so much more to it. Yeah. So much more to it. And you you hold on to those things, right? And that becomes that becomes the 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 start of your story. It start it, it becomes the start of um you finding those answers, not just about where you at, but who you are. Mm -hmm. You know, and because every, you know, almost every successful person I've ever known have stories of tragic tragedy, right? Of some sort. Of some sort. Yeah. So what makes your story any different from that person? They was brave enough to tell it. They were brave enough to embrace to it and go, up. you know, to open up. But not just that. They they were brave enough to go, I want to, I want to um be better. Mm -hmm. So you seek healing. You no longer seek the brokenness, right? You seek the healing of it. And in, in turn, most of them have found their, their purpose in this life, like, like ourselves, right? We go through these things. I can honestly say, you know, I know what the second most important day of my life is now. 
It sucks that I had to go through it, but had I not had gone through the things I've gone through, I would not be able to do the things that I'm doing now. You wouldn't be where you are. Exactly. And so I appreciate, I appreciate my son. Do I wish he was here? Yes. I appreciate uh, my dad, my brother, you know, my mother, my grandmothers. I wish they were all here. Right. But guess what? I'm, they I'm are. Doing, they are right. They're, they're looking over me. I can. I have my own little cheerleading squad upstairs. So when you see me walk around with a with a smile on my face, and I'm I, I got I got that groove. Trust me, I'm in my lane. I got a cheer. I got a I got a squad upstairs that's rooting me on. That stand. You can do it, mm-hmm. and I'm going to do it. You know, um, not just for myself, but for for my sister, for my nieces, and everything. I want to be an example. I want to break the stigma, but I also want to give. Um, my cousins, my male cousins, hope. I want mm-hmm. I want them to know because they've experienced their own set of loss, right? But I and I want them to let them know that hey, you're not by yourself. You you're not. The first thing you need to remember, you're not by yourself. And there is hope. And there's people just like you and I out there that's willing to walk with you every step of the way if you want it. The opportunity is there. We're not going anywhere. Right. We're just not getting started. Well, I I look at it as like those climbing walls, Mm -hmm. you know, where they have those different steps that you have to climb. Mm -hmm. And I know we don't ever stop looking at those steps that we just climbed down below. We don't really focus on them anymore. When you're climbing up that wall, you're climbing up to that next step. Mm -hmm. And that's how I envision it because it gets more and more exciting. You know, when you first start, it's like, oh God, how can I do this? <laughs> That's exactly what it is. You know, uh, we went on this journey. You hear a lot of people talk about taking the path up the mountain and everything like that, you know? And uh, so <laughs> my running joke is, is that I've, I've climbed many, many a mountains. Mm-hmm. I've never stood on top of one, right? You know what I'm saying? So the different variations of my life, I had to climb yeah. mountains come yeah. back down and get into a valley, go good for a little bit, right? Then everything drops off. Now I got to climb a bigger mountain, right? Now I got to get across that, you know? And I'm when, you, when you're when you searching for, for a way, you, you're looking for the path of least resistance when you're climbing these mountains, right? So you're looking for the yeah. pathway. What happens, just like you said, the rock climber, now I got to become a professional rock climber? You left me nothing? Yeah. You know? well, you, and then we look for those footholds, right? And the foothold could be a tiny little crack. You got to try to get your hand in there and develop and some sort of strength on. to be able to pull you, yeah, and pull yourself up to the next one, right? But now you and just got up to that next level now. Yeah, and, and and when you get up there, you're just like, okay, you look back down on it, goes, holy crap, how did I do that, right? How did because I do it? Yeah, <laughs> now you're up at the top of this one, and you get up there. Like when I found myself at the top of my last mountain, right? The journey getting up there, it was, it, it was, I mean, holy crap. Um, the, the smoothness of the, of the mountain would deter me. And I went, well, if you're not going to provide a way for me, then I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that. Right. Like you gave me nothing to hold on to. Yeah. And something was look around. Hey, dumbass, look around, look at all the boulders that are right there. Right. Then I realized those were the boulders that I had carried up to the next level to me, you know, to the next step in that mountain. And I went, okay. So I started placing them. And I went, you know what? I may not have a way up there, but I can use these to build something to get up there. So I did. And so there's there's one set of trauma, right? There's my mental health issues. There's my addiction issues that are laying out. I'm no longer carrying them. I've now used them. Now I'm going up to the next one. I can get across yeah. the smooth end. You know, I'm going to have yeah. to stretch a little bit, you know, because there's more I got to learn. I get up there and I'm going, okay, this is a little bit more like it. I have a rock that I can climb up over here because I, I left my burden down on the next one. Now right. we can get to the beat of it, right? You know what yeah. I'm yeah, now we can start figuring out what you're actually put here for. So here's where the meat comes in, right? So now you've left your burden down here. You're up to this point and I see no reason to go back. No. You know? I don't want to go back. I, I can see something up there. I want to. Beautiful I wanna, things up ahead. Yeah, you know, there's clouds, but you can't. You know, you don't really. That's the road to success. That's the road to journey. You know, and I often relate it relate to them both because I've been on both. Mm-hmm. I've been on a road to success to building a very successful personal training company to building a very um, lucrative and successful um, nonprofit. 
but it's so much more than that. Yeah. You know, and I'm getting up to these clouds and everything like that. Now I can climb myself back up. Now I'm sent above the clouds. And I realized that I still have more to go. I have more inside of me to give. So now let's start the downhill ascend, you know, on, on the other side of this mountain, right? And so doing that, I, I, I realized that, you know, when you have faith in, in the things that you do, you still have more work to do. Even though you climb this mountain, you're above the clouds, you don't know what's on the other side. Yeah. The, the question is, are you crazy enough to jump off to see? After everything that you've gone through, are you crazy enough to jump on the other side to see what's over there? If the question is, if, 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 if your answer is yes, jump. I did, right? And I got to the other side and hit the, hit the ground a little bit, right? Stumble, scrape my knees up, get up, run a little bit but there's something on the other side. I can't tell you what it is for, for the next person, but for me, yeah. it was, it was what I had built from all the tragedy from one side laid a comfortable foundation for me on the other side. Other side, Yeah. Right. Having faith in the things you don't see. So I got down there and I went, oh, hold on. What is this for me? And I, I've been running on it ever since then. And then, you makes know, you so um, excited. Yeah, it, it makes me excited, you know, because I got to the other side and I was like, oh my God, I have my own path. Mm -hmm. What? <laughs> so I've been running that path. And ever since then, it's like, you know, when people say, you know, stay in your own lane. And once you get there, find a gear to get in, but don't just ram it into gear. Right. Know, go through it. You know, once you find that gear that you're comfortable with, that you can get a nice, smooth, comfortable roll with, go with it. Go with it. And and just roll with the roll with the turbulence as you go on, you know, as they say. And and um eventually, you know, when that car breaks down, there's gonna be another car waiting for you. Everything has already been provided for you. So I encourage those men, take that road of grief. Allow yourself to to grieve properly okay. feel those emotions you know connect with other people and learn how to speak to your children about what you're going through don't don't hide it you know don't let them find out the hard way don't hide these things from your significant other because they deserve to know one thing we have to realize if you have a significant other that that's been with you over a period of time they know right you know and um don't don't shut them out and women have to do the same thing. Right. You know, we have to let each other in to increase our our conversations uh, and communication about grief. Right. And understanding, you know, like if you want this over here, we know that it's inevitable. Take those necessary steps to make sure that you can spend those precious precious moments with them, because tomorrow's not promised to you, you know. Um, and tonight is not promised with you to no. you neither. Right. You can walk out the house and somebody somebody um, hit you with a car. It's maybe an accident, but it's, just, it's a sequence of events that leads up to that. Right. Yeah. We all are connected in some way, form or another. We have to have these conversations. You know, we have to reclaim our manhood by being men, but no understanding that we're human beings as well. That's right. Yeah. And you have feelings. Yeah. Well, that was lovely, especially to end on that, Tony. Well, it's like you scripted it. <laughs> no, that was I, I blame you. I see your little screen <laughs> over here. So, <laughs> Tony, you say this right here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Passing you signals. Woo. Yeah, she's like, okay, we this is what we gotta do right here. So no, she's not doing that, you guys. She's not. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're gonna do a lot more of these because I think it's almost like every month or every other month we should definitely you know, come on and collaborate because we need to get more people to understand the feelings and, yeah. and, and open up and um, feel them because they're there, whether somebody's sick or going through a, an accident of some sort or with COVID or with death, it's, it's all the yeah. same. Well, they, all the it's, same. And you and you're absolutely right. And um, the one thing I wanted to put out there as well, something um, that we're going to be building, we're going to be doing a, grief, a, a live Q and A grief panel, um, and we're going to have um, 
well-renowned ther grief therapists, counselors, um, coaches, um, different nonprofits that that deal with trauma on this board, and we want people to chime in. We're going to we're going to tell people about the different variations of of our work um, mm -hmm. and our companies that we do. Um, so big promotion, but it's building a relationship with people across the board with the people that are listening, but also educating people um, and letting them know, because we want people to bring those questions, you know, um, yeah. um, about your loved ones, about this journey of grief that you're on. And um, we want you to, to take the journey with us. Yeah. You know, ask these, ask them hard questions, you know, um, and be around peer specialists um that that actually care we want is we want to educate you and um we want to help this grief journey um be as smooth as possible but the end with the knowledge that we have right so once a month getting together and everything and um you know I really would love if you if you're a part of that as well um and i think it's a good a good way to to educate each other yes you know be more supportive across the yeah, and every angle, because when we when we're thinking about this, we have to we have to look at the different angles. So yeah. and uh, yeah, no, oh, that's awesome. Well, that's going to be awesome uh, to look forward to that for any listeners out there. Um, I'll make sure I put Tony's information down below so we can get everybody um, going. Or perhaps you'd like to share it with somebody that you know that's going through something right now too, or that has, you know. There's never enough learning to be done, that's for sure. Well, thank you so much, so very much, Tony. Thank you, thank you, thank you for coming out today and sharing your story as well as all of your people that you've learned different things from. Um, it's amazing, amazing story. Um, I hope that all of our listeners have um gotten inspired and motivated and learned I always say learn one little thing and it's amazing um, from every discussion that we have that's for sure and I really appreciate each and every one for, uh, for listening that's for sure and please share like and subscribe to our channel because I know that um, we can all help others to to move forward and be that best person that we can be um, and share that, share the love, right? Share yes. the love. Share, share your pain with us. Yeah. You know, don't, don't carry it around with us. Share your, share your pain. And, take it uh, off your back. Uh, yeah. Take it off your back and get the love, man. Get the love. It's, it's a beautiful place to be um, when you, when you know you're loved. Yes, you know? sure is. When you can love and when you're loved, it's, yeah. it's a beautiful place. So thank you, everybody. And I always um, end with Carol Burnett in my podcast every week. So if you'd like to join in, Tony, you're welcome to. Um, Carol Burnett was uh, especially um, influential in my life, and I like to share the love that way. So right. I'm so glad we had this time together just I to have a laugh it. or sing a song. Thank you. Thanks we for just get me started. On. Oh, you're welcome. We just get started, and before you know it, comes the time we have to say so long. So long, everybody. Thank you so very much for coming out today, and or if you're listening to it after the live, thank you. Thank you, and we look forward to collaborating more with Tony and looking forward to doing more bigger and better things. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Welcome. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take us out. And thanks again, Tony. I'll see you very soon. All right. You have a good day. And thank you for thank having you. me on as well. You're welcome. Bye for now. Bye, everybody. Wear your mask. Wash your hands. Stay safe. <laughs>